All right, all right, here we go, here we go. I'm gonna have to treat this like the Black Southern Baptist Church in my hometown of Montgomery, Alabama, and bring everyone um, closer to a close here. Um, that brother, that preacher say something like, I know y'all thinking about headed out for lunch and everything here, but you know what? This is the Lord's Day, and we're gonna spend a little bit more time talking about the things that black folks talk about on Sundays. So, all right, there we go. I figured I'd get your attention there. All right, and I got an amen. Here we go. Who said uh, New England's not radical at all? All right, and we've heard that term a few times this morning. So I'm excited to introduce our next speaker to y'all. And this is, um, I would like to introduce you to James DeWolf Perry, as you can see, joining us on the screen. And as you've noted from the program, he is going to talk about tracing the trade. What a family learned wrestling with the memory of New England's role in slavery and in the slave trade. James will share his family's efforts to recover the memory of New England's role in slavery and the slave trade through their PBS documentary, Traces of the Trade, a story from the deep north, as well as books, dialogues, workshops, works of art, and political activism. He will also discuss the reasons this history became largely erased from our public memory and why remembering has proven so difficult. It's funny, when it comes to race and slavery, memory is an interesting thing as we move beyond that. Why are even the simple facts involved and so controversial, are so controversial to acknowledge? What are the roots of our resistance to remembering? And how can this nation begin to move forward honestly and in a spirit of healing? Ooh, I'm really curious about that last part, too. All right, folks, I give you James DeWolf Perry. Let's give him a round of applause. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. Uh, good morning. It's good to be with you, even if it has to be virtually. Um, I, at the risk of being repetitious, I really want to thank the organizers of this symposium, uh, Susan Edwards and everyone else who worked on this. As you all probably realize, in addition to the tremendous task of putting on something like this, they had to deal with the pandemic and therefore with so much uncertainty uh, for such a long time and so many difficult questions. And I'm just grateful to Susan and the others who uh, managed to work through all of that and put this conference on. Um, these are all outstanding scholars that we're getting to hear from today um, who are greatly enriching our understanding of history and bringing traditionally marginalized voices to the forefront. Um, my own work doesn't fall under history, but the category of public history. In particular, I help to communicate this sort of history to the general public and to work with educators and museum staff and others on how best to teach and interpret this history, given all the challenges that that poses in this case. I focus especially on the question of why this history is so challenging for many Americans to hear. White Americans in particular, but by no means just white Americans, frequently reject this history, or as we all understand, will push back in one way or another when we talk about what this history is or what its significance has been. I don't think the answers to why that is are quite as simple as we often assume. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that this morning. But first for me, this is also a deeply personal story. I'm gonna be focusing on my own family's history in New England, my family's connection to slavery, which turned out to be nothing like I would have imagined when I was growing up here how we've uncovered and responded to that history, and how I think that ties into the broader topic of white history when it comes to slavery and race and efforts to recover this memory as a public, to acknowledge and address this history. So what I'd like to do is begin by talking a little bit about my family's story, not just what the history was, but how our family in the 21st century tried our best to grapple with this history, to acknowledge it, 
for the first time in many generations and where we thought knowing this history could take us. I think our family story is in a sense a microcosm of how our society more broadly has forgotten this history, misremembered it, distorted it, minimized it, and how we can try to undo some of the damage to our public memory that's been done. Um, I'm going to begin this by talking about my own personal introduction to my family's history, because I think there are lessons to be drawn there. I grew up as a white person in a white family in New England. And growing up, my family was a very modest means, very modest means. But we had a rich heritage in New England. I had ancestors who came over on the Mayflower in 1620. I had ancestors who fought in the American Revolution. I have ancestors for whom there are monuments in New England and the rest of the country. And you can believe I heard a lot about that growing up in a family with that heritage. I heard a great deal from my grandfather, for instance, who has the same name I do, James DeWolf Perry. I'm the sixth James DeWolf Perry in direct line of succession. If that gives you some idea how much our family took our history seriously. I heard a great deal about the figures in our family and what they had meant. And it gave me a tremendous sense of belonging. I mean, I can't overemphasize, and I'm sure a number of you understand this one way or another, how much that made me feel connected to our society, how much it made me feel like, however modest my own family was today, that we somehow belonged and were connected and had our place here. And it turned out to be a gross distortion of our family history. The clue I should have had was the name, James DeWolf Perry. I knew and I heard all the time about the accomplishments of the James DeWolf Perrys who'd come before me. I even knew that the first James DeWolf Perry had been named for his grandfather, James DeWolf. And I knew really two things about James DeWolf. I knew he was a Rhode Island merchant who had been tremendously successful in the business, had become a senator, a United States senator by the end of his life. And when he died, the newspapers reported that he was at that time the second richest man in the country. That's how they put it, the second richest man in the country. That's all I knew about him. That's all I heard about him. And I think that should have been another warning that in a family that remembered its history so much, such a prominent figure, a figure so many of us were named for, we knew almost nothing about. When I was an adult, I was approached at a family funeral by a distant cousin of mine named Katrina Brown. And Katrina had what seemed like a very odd question for me. She asked if I'd ever heard anything about our family doing a little bit of slave trading, a little bit of slave trading. And I immediately remembered that I had heard something and I'd forgotten it or repressed it. I'd minimized it. When I was a child, my grandfather had once mentioned that James DeWolf had tried his hand at the slave trade. That's how he put it. He tried his hand at the slave trade. Now, I knew James DeWolf had extensive merchant operations. I learned as an adult that James DeWolf at the time of the War of 1812 had more ships in his merchant fleet than the United States Navy had warships, a fact that actually became important in the war as the United States turned to privateering from James DeWolf and others. With such extensive merchant operations, as a child, I assumed it was natural at that time to try the slave trade. It was something that happened then. It was something that was widely accepted. It sounded to me like he tried it, didn't like it, maybe didn't approve of it, maybe detested it, and that was the end of it. And so I'd minimized it. I'd forgotten it as something that wasn't ultimately of significance, even though, of course, it was. And so when Katrina mentioned this, I told her that, and she said she wanted to make a historical documentary to tell the story of one white New England family and the small connection that they had to slavery as a way of illustrating the point that so many white New England families have some sort of connection to this history. We're all in one way or another bound up in it. And those white families that were actually here at the time can often find some connection. And I thought it seemed like a wonderful idea to show this modest connection 
to slavery and the slave trade in New England. And so I began to help her with the film. I did some of the early fundraising for the film. Uh, I became the principal historical consultant for the film. Uh, we were later nominated for an Emmy Award for the historical research into the DeWolf family in the film. And along the way, two things happened that absolutely transformed what this story meant for us. The first is in the course of doing the historical research, we discovered that James DeWolf had not tried his hand at the slave trade. As with so many other badly remembered parts of this history, James DeWolf had tried his hand at the slave trade and he continued. He continued to the point where he made his fortune largely on the slave trade and to the point where he became the leading slave trader in the history of the United States. No American did more slave trading to the best of our knowledge than James DeWolf. He and his extended family together brought more than 12,000 Africans across the Middle Passage. And we estimate in the film that that probably translates to something like half a million people today who are descended from those the DeWolfs brought over. Half a million people. As you can imagine, that was difficult knowledge to learn and difficult knowledge to not just accept, but to try to be committed to remembering and to speaking about and to doing something about. Um, I was greatly aided in having my feet held to the fire in terms of doing something about this by the second thing that happened along the way to making this film, which was that Katrina decided in the wake of that information, she couldn't make this a historical documentary about the past. She wanted to show DeWolf descendants today, DeWolf descendants in the 21st century, learning this history, grappling with what it means to learn this history and talking on camera about what to do with that knowledge today. And so Katrina invited DeWolf descendants to take a literal journey on camera across the Triangle Trade from New England to the West Coast of Africa, to Cuba as one of the many ports, Havana and Matanzas in particular, where the DeWolfs took their slave ships and back to New England to discuss the implications of all of this today. Ultimately, 10 of us agreed to do that and appear on camera taking that journey. I was one of them. I honestly will never know if I would have had the courage to say yes to that invitation if she'd asked me that at the outset. I was already deeply involved in the project um, and felt I really needed to take that next step and accept that invitation. But I, I simply will never know if I would have had the courage to do that otherwise. So we took that journey. The result was the film Traces of the Trade, a story from the deep north. The film debuted at the Sundance Film Festival in 2008 and then aired nationwide on PBS later in 2008. Um, as I say, we take a literal journey across the triangle trade in the film. We have some very awkward conversations and some sharp differences of opinion among the 10 of us about what to make of the history and those who engaged in the slave trade as well as what to do about it today. Um, we had a variety of goals, I think, the 10 of us in making this film, and you can see that in the film itself. Some of you, I'm sure, have seen this. I assume most of you have not. Um, for many of the 10 of us, I think it was more than anything else, a personal journey, a journey that they needed to take to wrestle with their own demons regarding not just knowing about the family history and the slave trade, but about their role as white people in a society where race is such a tremendous issue today. Um, for Katrina herself, who was ultimately the director and the narrator, as well as one of the 10 of us in the film, it was about class as much as anything else. Like some DeWolf descendants, Katrina grew up with a great deal of money, money that one way or another um, would not exist in their branches of the family without this tremendous slave trade 200 years ago. Um, and she was very open about feeling tremendous guilt and shame about that fact and wanted to wrestle with those feelings on camera. Um, and she did so. I think for others of us, it was maybe a bit more about a question of a sense of responsibility. If we're not personally responsible for what our ancestors did 200 years ago, what do we do today to wrestle with the fact that one way or another, 
whether it's money, whether it's education, whatever it is, simply a sense of heritage and belonging, like I talked about before. What do we make of this story today? What's our responsibility for doing something to undo the damage? I think for a number of us, this film was more than anything else, a chance to acknowledge the history publicly as DeWolf descendants, but as white people who are connected in some fashion to this history as we all in one way or another are. For a number of us, education was always a big part of this. How do we tell this story? Not just the story of the DeWolf descendants in particular, but the story of all of New England and its tremendous and very important role in slavery and the slave trade and what that did to make New England and the nation what they are today. Um, and for many of us, there was a desire to do something about what we can broadly call racial justice really trying to use this film and this broader project as an opportunity to move forward. Um, there's a moment in the film where one of the 10 of us openly endorses the idea of reparations for slavery. It's my own father. And I'm tremendously proud of him for doing this because my father at other moments in the film says some very awkward and unfortunate things, um, trying in the moment to minimize his own privilege as a white person and as a DeWolf descendant um, in ways that he quickly regretted. Um, but in that moment, my father took a lesson from his own father. He remembered my grandfather telling him in the 1960s when my grandfather was a New Englander in the South that he agreed with Dr. King and his movement, but thought it was essential that they go much more slowly. They have to slow it down my father remembers his father telling him, it's too much too fast. And the lesson my father took from that is that whatever he did, he can't urge caution or slowness, that race has gone on for too long as a tremendous problem in our society, that we need to move faster, not slower. And so my father in the film says reparations appears to be to him the only game in town to finally really address this history. And he wanted to endorse reparations for that reason alone. So those are some of the, the motivations I think we had as we made the film. Um, in the end, we've responded to this in a number of different ways. I mentioned Katrina talking about feelings of guilt and shame, even during the course of the film, which took a couple of years to film. You can see her shift as she talks with others of us and thinks through all of this, talks with African-Americans today about how to approach this history. She clearly shifts from a sense of guilt and shame to feeling some of the others of us were talking about from the beginning. Um, feelings of grief and sorrow about this history and our ancestors' role in it, and more of a feeling about a need to get past our feelings about this, whatever they are, and come to a place of responsibility about all of this. And I think one way or another, the 10 of us all came to a greater place of responsibility. Um, we founded the Tracing Center, a nonprofit organization. Some of us worked through the Tracing Center, others of us independently. Um, one way or another, the 10 of us uh, were involved uh, in all kinds of responses, speaking and giving presentations about the film and about the family's history, what we did, what we learned. Through the Tracing Center, Katrina and I developed workshops and dialogue programs um, for schools, for churches, uh, for museums and historic sites. Um, the family all had different ways to respond to this based on their gifts. Uh, this is a distant cousin of mine in the film, Elizabeth Sturgis. She's a teacher in New York City. In her spare time, she does a lot of art. And so she has made uh, paintings, for example, trying to explore this history and what it means to her, and especially the ways in which this history was buried in our family and we're trying to bring it to light. In this image, which hopefully you can see, she's created a dress and on the outside of the dress, you see all the elegant scenes of our family 200 years ago. And the moment you open the dress, you can start to see what made all of that opulence possible. The shackles, those who were enslaved, the slaving ships and so forth, the kinds of history that always underpinned all of that. Others of us uh, worked on books. Um, you see here a couple of examples of that. Um, one of these is my own, one of the volumes that I've written in to talk about some of this history, and in particular, as I said, the question of how it is we can recover the memory of this history as a society. Um, other family members have worked on things like legislation to try to address questions like, 
like reparations or racial justice more broadly. Uh, Katrina herself spoke uh, at the first hearing that Congress held on HR 40, the legislation that John Conyers introduced for about 30 years in every Congress to try to form a commission, and it's still pending before Congress right now, try to form a commission to come to terms as a nation with what this history is and what we can do about it, whether we can issue an apology, which the United States still has not actually done despite several close attempts, um, whether there are other steps we need to take to make repair and to begin to heal from this process. There are a wide variety of possible approaches to all of this. In all of this, um, as I say, for me, a burning question is how do we remember and misremember this history? This is, of course, history that historians have never forgotten. Certainly not the basic facts, the facts that many white people push back on when they hear them or wish they had learned as children when they learn about them as adults. Um, in recent generations, historians have done a vastly better job of uncovering this history of telling much richer stories, much fuller stories, much more diverse stories about this history. And we've got tremendous examples of that here this morning uh, and throughout the day. Um, but our public memory has in many ways gotten worse over the years, not better. And so that's something that I believe very strongly in grappling with. This is Bristol, Rhode Island. This is an example of how Bristol remembers it. Bristol was the home of the DeWolf family. Bristol, Rhode Island sent out more slaving voyages than any other US port in history. And yet that's very poorly remembered in town. That's starting to change slowly, but it's generally been very poorly remembered. One person in our film suggests that it would be much more appropriate if Bristol had a sign coming into town saying that Bristol was the historic center of US slave trading. And I think that is really emblematic of how we ought to remember a clear and comprehensive picture of New England's history and all of this. Um, you see here a DeWolf warehouse. You see it about 20 years ago before it was renovated. This was one of James DeWolf's warehouses um, in the port of Bristol uh, at the time of the slave trade. It was purchased and renovated and turned into a restaurant, the DeWolf Tavern. Now, the DeWolf Tavern is an excellent restaurant, highly regarded. You see the image below of the interior of this old warehouse after it was renovated. But this is literally the warehouse of a slave trader, an integral part of his operations, one we filmed in for Traces of the Trade, um, and a way in which it's celebrated today, complete with rum drinks. And I'm sure you all understand the significance of rum to the triangle trade and to the Middle Passage slave trade. This is a quotation from a history of Newton, Massachusetts, where I grew up. This is 1854, it's before the Civil War. It's well within memory of widespread slavery in New England. Slavery was never congenial with New England society or New England character and consequently never took root or acquired permanency among the Puritans or their descendants. This is how much the history of New England was being rewritten on the ground, regardless of what individuals intended or didn't intend, but how the history was being rewritten at the time. This is within living memory. These are people who largely would have known just how long slavery had existed in New England, how deeply a part of our society it was, how integral a part of our economic success it was. And yet it's written with a straight face, as it were, that it was never congenial with New England character and never acquired permanency here. Um, just imagine how much more the rewriting was after slavery passed from living memory, after the Civil War and the tremendous attempt to explain the Civil War in the North as a moral struggle against slavery, which for the most part, the Civil War simply was not. But this is the extent of our misremembering. As I said before, I think it's not as simple as we often assume to talk about why it is we misremember, why the memory faded from our public knowledge, even while our historians preserve this knowledge, um, why it is that there's so much pushback, especially among white people. 
when we talk about a topic like the role of slavery and race in New England. Um, as I say, it's, it's everywhere. And part of the problem is that it can be, you know, the, the, the false narratives can be found in history books, certainly in textbooks in schools. Um, it's misleading everywhere. Here in Massachusetts, for example, you will often hear that we abolished slavery in 1783 by law in the Quack Walker case. So this was a court case that was ultimately resolved and is often cited as the end of slavery in New England. It was not. Um, the Quack Walker case did not end slavery. An examination of the court case makes that very clear. An examination of the context for the case makes very clear that it may have been one step in a long, slow, gradual process of the ending of slavery in New England by a variety of means largely driven by black and white abolitionists working largely in concert. But you will hear from many reputable individuals and institutions to this day that slavery simply was abolished here in 1783. It's a very comforting narrative that slavery ended abruptly, that it ended earlier than it really did, um, that it was largely white people, because of course the implication of it ending by law at that time meant that it was largely white people choosing to end slavery, presumably out of conviction. And that's simply not how history unfolded. Um, and I think that starts to get to the question of why it is that it's so hard for us to remember correctly. Um, we, I think, tend to very easily assume that slavery is hard to talk about and hard to grapple with today because it's a bad history. Slavery was awful. Slavery was violent and brutal. If there wasn't violence at a particular moment, the threat of violence was always behind the scenes. Um, sexual abuse, for example, was rampant. This is a hard history for anyone to talk about. It's easy to understand why white people are often reluctant to talk about it, why black Americans, for example, are often uneasy talking about this. Um, and yet, I don't think it's anywhere near as simple as that. We often talk about the fact that this history has painful legacies today for so many Americans in so many different ways. And there's truth to that as well, but I don't think it's as simple as people being reluctant to talk about this because it's a sensitive topic or because it quickly raises questions like the possibility of racial justice or reparations. I think instead this comes to the heart of questions about identity. And I'm gonna talk about this very briefly. Um, James Baldwin is talking here about how central history and in particular this kind of history can be to our own identities. Um, there's been some great work in recent decades um, by psychologists and others talking about how narrative, how storytelling is essential to our sense of self, to our own identities. At the core of who we are, um, we find stories and they're largely stories about our own lives that tell us who we are, where we as individuals have come from. But a big part of that is our understanding of what groups we belong to as part of our identity and what the stories, the narratives of those groups are. And so I'm talking about all different kinds of identity here, what family we belong to, what social class, what region of the country, what ethnic group, our national identity as Americans, um, it's religious, it's professional affiliations, what have you. And in all of this, our social identities are formed by the, the narratives these groups tell, what our shared understandings are about what history these groups have had and what central themes can be drawn from them. So in the case of the history of this region, as it's told by the region, by the nation, by families, by institutions of all kinds here, um, we tend to get certain familiar historical narratives and familiar historical themes. We talk about self-reliance and entrepreneurship, myths about the settling of this area and what that meant, talk of free labor and the importance of individual merit in getting, in advancing as individuals and institutions in a society. As you can see here, we talk about the value of small scale farming or commerce. We talk also about immigration and themes of hard work and discrimination that immigrants face. All of these, of course, are valid historical themes in our history. But those narratives, when they're told, are often excluding other stories. And in particular, slavery is often powerfully present in these stories by its omission. 
the ownership of enslaved people, economic activity that's dependent upon slavery, the slave trade, they're not told where the history in a place like New England is greatly minimized and its long-term significance is minimized. This becomes an essential part of these identities such that if other stories are told that clashes with the identities so many people have at their core and therefore force at a very basic level, a pushback against these narratives. It is very difficult to simply take in a new narrative and form an improved narrative that includes these new stories. Um, I don't wanna take the time to go through some of the mechanisms by which this happens. There are familiar mechanisms like cognitive bias, the desire of people to reject information and authorities that, have, that are setting up a clash with the narratives that they hold at their core. Most people don't think of themselves as knowing all of this history very well, but when pushed to incorporate the story of enslaved people or the ways in which white people in New England have historically been a part of slavery and race, that's when people suddenly push back because it turns out their dimly remembered history centrally includes slavery not being present or not being significant if it's present or being present primarily in the form of abolition rather than anything else. And so um, there, are, there are patterns that come up when we try to talk to many people about this history. And there are ways, there are techniques to try to move past this, to give people space, to incorporate this new information, to help it become more real for them, to help confront honestly the myths that they hold and hold them up against a more balanced truth all of these techniques are designed to try to help people through this process so that we can get to a point where more Americans can acknowledge this history, especially white Americans, where we can get to a point where we can begin to move past this history, not to forget it, but to understand it better and more fully and more richly so that we can then try to move ourselves to a place where we can heal from this, where we can genuinely try to figure out, and it will be a long and hard process, no doubt, and a gargantuan task, but actually try to establish a society where we're moving forward from this history in an honest way, and in a way that finally tries to deal with the reality of what the legacy of this history is. So I've talked a fair bit. I have had absolutely no cues from looking at all of you as to whether you're interested or not, whether you're eager to say something or to object or not. Um, so at this point, I'd like to move on and see if there are questions. I'd be very interested in any, in any comments or questions you might have. And with that, thank you very much. Any questions uh, from the audience for James here? Yes. What was the court case again in 1783? So this was the Quok Walker case. And there were a series of related court cases. Um, the Mumbet case, for example, but the Quok Walker case in 1783 is frequently cited uh, as a moment when slavery was abolished by law. And often the most that you hear after that is that slavery took a while to die out in practice, but that it had been abolished by law. Instead, this court case said nothing of the kind. And in fact, that legal argument completely clashed with the law in Massachusetts. And so telling this story then obscures the reality of what did happen, which was Quok Walker in effect had his own independence recognized in this court case, which was actually an assault case, but nevertheless had that effect. And others brought their own individual cases with the help of abolitionists. And it was these individual grassroots efforts, these highly organized efforts that slowly over time produced results. Massachusetts did not abolish slavery by law until the 1840s, which is obviously far later and has powerful implications for where white people in Massachusetts were during those decades. You had a question. 
So I'm going to repeat the question, make sure everyone heard it right, and I'll do my best to get it right. So essentially, we're at a time right now, uh, particularly among white folks, that want to outlaw and remove the teaching of much of what you've shared over things such as race, of slavery, um, and of course, we know even things like critical race theory, right? That's like the scariest word for white folks you ever heard. Um, most white folks can't even tell me what critical race theory is. <laughs> if you know, let me know. So. Um, so what's your response to that, where well, there's so much pushback, and you've shared some resources in terms of how we engage in this conversation, James? Mm -hmm. So I apologize. I'm going solely on the repeating of the question. I can't hear the question itself. I spent a fair bit of time uh, looking into the details this spring of the legislation being proposed in various states much of which, of course, is very similar because there are organized groups promoting them and sharing ideas and the rhetoric around the promotion of this legislation. And one of the striking facts I hope everyone appreciates about this debate in our society is that much of the talk is about critical race theory and about some very scary ideas that certain white people are pushing hard to keep out of schools, whereas the legislation itself is written entirely differently. Most of the legislation that has been passed or is pending is very reasonable on the surface. It doesn't talk about critical race theory. It talks about not teaching our history in a way that makes certain people feel they should have a sense of guilt based on their race, that they should not be made to feel shamed, that we should not promote group division in the teaching of this history, principles that I would hope we would all agree are important and good, even if sometimes we run up against the edges of that as we do the necessary task of teaching this history and what it means. Clearly what's going on here to me is, and I hate to use terms like white fragility or white panic, but I've just done it. Um, there are people for whom this is terrifying and I think it's illuminating what is frightening people this sense that if we teach this history, we are going to have students in schools, white students, feeling oppressed, that they will be made to feel ashamed for being white, that they will be made to feel responsible by virtue of their race. And I think this gets back to what I was talking about, about narrative and identity. It is challenging to hear this. How does a white person who's got a certain sense of identity and what white accomplishment in this country has been, how does that white person turn around and incorporate new information without feeling like white people have done terrible things in our history? Which in a very real sense, of course, is completely true. And that therefore they should feel ashamed or should feel like they bear guilt because of their race, which they should not. But it's all of these feelings that come up that are part of how I think we need to respond sensitively with an understanding of what this means to people's identity. We, if we want to make progress, if we don't just want to tell the right history the right way and do the right thing in that regard, but if we want to help more white people acknowledge this history and become part of the fight to do better, we have to work. And it's understandably hard for a lot of people who don't want to indulge white feelings. I get that, but it is essential that we able, be able to work with white feelings that come up and help people work through them to feel that they are not being asked to have those feelings, but are instead being asked to have constructive and appropriate feelings and that there is a path forward to them that will actually feel good to them by the time they're through the process as hard as it might be. Other questions? So we do have one virtual. Go ahead, Bethany. So I, I heard coming to the table. So if I got the, the gist of that, um, coming to the table is a wonderful organization. It was founded by other people than those of us who are DeWolf descendants in this project. Um, but we quickly as DeWolf descendants became involved in the project and have been for about 15 years now. Coming to the table is a national organization. I would urge anyone interested to Google coming to the table and take a look. Um, there are affiliate groups throughout the country, the fundamental purpose of which is to bring white people and black people together 
to sit down at the table, as it were, together to talk about this shared history. That includes people who know that their ancestors, white and black, were on both sides of the slavery divide, as well as people who don't have that particular shared history but want to be honest about what their family connection to this might be. Um, it is an incredibly powerful way for people who are moved to have those kinds of conversations to move forward in understanding and shared dialogue. And it's been a powerful growing voice for things like racial justice. And it's also been um, the inspiration for a couple of wonderful books, the little book of racial healing, for example, which can be very helpful to a lot of groups as they work through this process. Another question. I've seen, I mean, I've done hundreds of talks and presentations and workshops, and I've seen a tremendous variety of responses to this history and to our acknowledgement of it. Um, I've been especially pleased when there have been white people who have been moved by this to step forward. Um, we have sent a lot of people to groups like Coming to the Table. Um, I can tell you that Katrina speaking, testifying before Congress on HR 40, Whatever individual people feel about that particular piece of legislation was a powerful moment for healing a white person, being willing to take the risk to acknowledge this very publicly. Um, and it's inspired others to talk about their own family history, to dig into that, to share with other family members a difficult history. I have seen more and more people uh, moving their own history forward so that the next generation and the next will have a fuller sense of their family's history and what made it possible. And for me, that's been tremendously important. I have been especially impressed when I have talked to young people in elementary school and high school classrooms and in college classrooms, people who are empowered by this knowledge. Um, I have frequently, for example, been in majority black or all black classrooms where black students have often said some variation of this. They have said, we knew something about this history before. We're not shocked to hear this. But hearing the details and hearing the fullness of it and hearing white people acknowledge this history is empowering. And it allows us to go forward with more confidence to have conversations across racial lines and ask for change. And I think that's the key more than anything else for me is seeing people with a greater awareness and understanding and a willingness to take whatever the next step might be. Yeah, we have another question. It is entirely possible to my understanding that Massachusetts might have had absolutely no enslaved people by the 1830s. What happened in practice was a tremendous fight to emancipate enslaved people. It was certainly well underway in the 1780s, uh, as well as gradual shifts that made the enslavement of people in New England less profitable or less socially desirable. There were plantations of enslaved people in Rhode Island. There were lots of enslaved people in larger coastal cities. There were, of course, in New England, a lot of slaves owned one or two to a family as servants or as enslaved laborers on farms. And that was never tremendously economically profitable. And with changes in social understandings and so forth, there were people who were emancipated or ran away, self-emancipated, or people who were sold south, which was a tremendous problem as slavery became less relevant here. And this all began, in my understanding, with the American Revolution, which one way or another caused a lot of enslaved people to either run away or to be freed so that they could fight in the war. Um, that's a whole complicated story. And so by the 1830s, there may have been, as far as I understand this, no enslaved people. And what's striking by that point is how controversial abolition still was among white people in New England and the extent to which there was very little desire to actually pull the trigger and have a formal abolition of slavery here. 
but Massachusetts was not New Jersey, which had enslaved people at the time of the Civil War and initially refused to ratify the 13th Amendment to the Constitution because it didn't want to abolish slavery. Okay. James, that was exceptional and wonderful, and we appreciate your time. Uh, let's give them a, another... 